Maybe this is just my opinion, but every week so far, for the last three weeks, they keep upping the ante. Let's talk about some Nosferatu. So this week on Nosferatu, the gas mask man hath cometh. But more on that in just one second. Hello everybody, my name is Robbie. If you're brand new to this channel, I am what my Aunt Ethel once called the television film and gaming equivalent to doing the Macarena in the DMV. I don't really know what that means, but my instincts tell me that it's complimentary and slightly whimsical, so I'll take it that way. I hope I have been wrong before. And before we jump into this episode of Nosferatu Recap, I want to give a big shout out and a giant bear hug. I swear to God, I'm like a Care Bear right now, giving you guys hugs to all of the pop cultists over at patreon.com slash nerdynomicon. These are the ones keeping the lights on. That light that's kind of lighting up the stage that you guys just saw and that you're going to see again in just one second. These are the ones that power those lights with the, with the power of love, man, of love of pop culture, of love of TV and cinema analysis. These are the ones. If you want to join the ranks and you want early access to all the videos and the podcasts, go over to patreon.com slash nerdynomicon. Literally, for a dollar a month, you get early access to everything that's going on here. And the more you pledge per month, the more cool rewards you guys have access to. That's how it works. Patreon.com slash nerdynomicon. All right, enough of this. Let's get back to the episode. So, this episode. Um... I, I called it out and said that this episode was probably the best one so far. They keep upping the bar for me, and I stand by that. In this episode, you we start out seeing another potential creative. Oh, and by the way, spoiler free time is over, man. If you haven't watched the show yet and you're interested, check out episodes one and two because I cover episodes one and two. Uh, and those are spoiler free, but from here on out, we're going to have a discussion. We're going to dive into it because I want to hear what you guys have to say in the comments down below. I want to hear what you guys have to say about these episodes as we go along. Um, so we start out seeing Charlie Manx, who is now old again, going and talking to another potential creative. And I don't necessarily remember this from the book. I'm not saying that it did not occur. Uh, there definitely was a hospital at the beginning of the book, which was nightmare inducing. But I don't remember anything like this. And it's pretty interesting seeing as though all of these highly creative people, the um, super creatives or whatever you want to call them, they all have what's called a knife to cut the barrier between um, imagination and possibility and reality. So for Vic McQueen, it's her bike. For Charlie Manx, it's the Wraith. And for this old lady that uh, Charlie's visiting right at the beginning, apparently it's a pair of roller skates. And it leads me to wonder exactly what her ability was, what she could do. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really curious because we've only seen three abilities so far, three people that have this power. We've seen Charlie, we've seen Maggie Lee, and we've seen Vic McQueen. Uh, Maggie's knife are, is, is her tiles. What do the roller skates do? What exactly is this lady capable of? And why does it seem like she's so terrified of Charlie and Charlie seems to see her as a foil for his nefarious plans? Um, and we do see her twice in this episode. Once when Charlie shows up to question her if she's the one that's uh, got the shorter way bridge that seems to be a little bit of a threat to him that he's kind of nervous about. He realizes that she's not the one. And then Maggie Lee finds her later on in the episode. So it leads me to wonder if she's going to play a bigger role going forward. And if, is she even really that elderly? Like, is she really an elderly woman like we're seeing in this scene? I don't know. Because the Wraith has this weird ability to suck the life force out of children and turn them into these demonic vampire-like things. Maybe after leaving Christmasland it has an aging effect or something like that as well? Um, I don't know. Or maybe, maybe her age was the cost of cutting through her inscape. With Vic, it's the splitting migraines and the blood in her eye. With Maggie, it's the it's the stutter. Maybe, maybe that's what's going on. I don't know. Or maybe she's just an old lady. I mean, Charlie's been doing this shit for over a hundred years now, so it's hard to say. But what I wanted to talk about the most is the gas mask man. So when I read Nosferatu the first time. Gas Mask Man was quite sinister to me. He was this shape, this 
He was just this nefarious shape that lumbered toward you and that when you saw it coming, it was impending doom. Um, not to mention the ch the stunted mindset, the childlike, the the nefarious childlike whimsy of Bing Partridge, who is the gas mask man in the books. It was it was unsettling. It was disturbing. It's something that sticks with you. In the audiobook that I listened to while I was driving here, there, and everywhere, when I had a different day job and I listened to a lot of books on tape, Kate Mulgrew's interpretation of the gas mask man was not so great. Uh, as a matter of fact, I do know people who legitimately do not like this book simply because they started out with the audiobook, and Bing Partridge in that is incredibly annoying. He's not scary, he's annoying, he's bothersome, he's superfluous. It, it, he takes on a completely different persona in that. Now we get to see him as an actor, and we're seeing him in a slightly different way because the, again, the series is going in different directions than just following the novel, you know, beat for beat. It's using it more as a template at this point, because I, it's quite obvious right now that the plot is different. Or at least the season one plot. <sighs> and Bing Partridge is frightening. He's very, very frightening. You're seeing this childlike, um, stunted adult. A man with probably the mindset and mentality of a nine or ten year old, when in actuality he's at least 45, 50. Which can be cute and can be endearing, but when harnessed for evil, it's there's very few things that I think is are are as terrifying as this. The whole idea of Christmas Land and the idea of what these creatures that Charlie Manx turns the children into is childlike children at heart forever childlike mentality forever and keep in mind without guidance without discipline children's ideas of fun can manifest as destruction and they don't realize it because they don't realize the repercussions and the ramifications that's one of the themes of lord of the flies so a child without being instructed without learning without being disciplined will pull the wings off of a fly just to see what happens with it, and they'll squeal with delight. They'll they'll roast a ma an ant with a magnifying glass because they they don't have the empathy to understand what's going on. It's just a bug. It's not another human. You know, blah blah blah. It's only with guidance and with repercussions and with ramifications to their action, without discipline, without understanding, without empathy, that the childlike mentality incorporates these things and turns that mentality into a fully functioning adult. That is what is lacking in Christmas Land, and that is the type of mentality that Bing Partridge has. The stunted youth. The youth without empathy. The youth without forethought. The youth without ramifications, without discipline. Pure id. And pure id can be a terrifying thing. Because pure id and pure superego, that is... That is what can cause a lot of problems. That is what can cause a lot of destruction because you don't stop to think that the person that you're hurting actually can hurt. Everybody else is peripheral to that, if that makes any sense. I mean, it, it's one of the most terrifying things and that is what Bing Partridge is. And when he donned the gas mask and when he started using the SIBO flooring, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying, and I cannot wait to see more of this. Now, if you disagree with my breakdown of what a pure child at heart thought process can be, please feel free to let me know in the comments down below. I stand by that. Also, I mean, my description is definitely paraphrased from, but that is some of the things that Joe Hill actually said um, in interviews about what these children are in Nosferatu. So, I mean, I, I stand by that, and that's why I think that Bing is so menacing, is because he's almost like a version of the children from Christmas Land without the demonic aspect of it. It's just... Uh, frightening. It's just frightening, I guess. I don't know, I'm groping for words right now. So, and uh, at the end of this episode, the hunt is on, okay? Uh, Manx is after Vic, but even though Vic's been warned by Maggie, she doesn't care. She's like, this is weird. I, I don't understand what's going on here. This is weird. You're weird. Get out of my life. I, I just want to be a normal person. My parents are already screwing up my future. I don't have time for this weird wraith-driving vampire dude. 
But uh, Manx is hunting her, and he's just taken this little girl that Vic is friends with, and now Vic is chasing him. So now we've got a game of cat and mouse against a game of cat and mouse. So it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to be happening for the rest of the season. I cannot wait for the next episode, and I cannot wait to talk to you guys about it. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Specifically, what did you think of this Bing Partridge, the Gas Mask Man? Did it live up to the books? Do you agree with me that it was far better than the audiobook? Let me know down there below. Don't forget to hit that like button. Do not forget to hit that subscribe button. It helps the channel out more than you can even imagine. And I will talk to you guys next week on Nosferatu Recap. Oh, hells yes.